Ray, you have helped all of us understand what the implications are of computing power and what it will mean just in this current century. But if we try to take that further, to look out not a hundred years, but a million or hundreds of millions of years, which people try to do, what can we now think about differently than we did in the past? Well, let me give you a perspective that you don't actually have to go that far to have fantastic implications of multiplying our intelligence trillions fold or trillions of trillions fold. And the important perspective to have is that the progression of this is exponential and not linear. And most people say, yeah, sure, that's true, but they really don't appreciate the profound implications of it. And I have a whole theory that, that evolution is inherently an accelerating exponential process. You know, it took a billion years for DNA to evolve, but then evolution adopted DNA, and so the Cambrian explosion went 100 times faster. And an evolutionary process, biological or technological, accelerates because it incorporates its discoveries, and then the next stage goes more quickly. So our, our whole species, is the technology-creating species, uh, evolved in only a few hundred thousand years. And then evolution, the, the cutting edge, focused on human technological creations. And that became its own evolutionary process. It started with steps that were tens of thousands of years, stone tools, fire. We always use the latest technology to create the next. And so that process has accelerated. And if you look at today, we're actually doubling the power of information technology every year. Doubling every year is pretty fantastic because that means multiplying by a thousand in 10 years, a billion in 30 years. There's actually a slow second level of exponential growth, so 25 years to be exact. Think mm. about how influential information technology is today. We carry in our pockets computers that are many thousands of times more powerful than the entire computation that all of MIT had when I, when I went here 40 years ago. And imagine multiplying it another billion fold while at the same time we shrink the size of these devices 100,000 in the next quarter century. And we're also making progress on the software side. We're understanding how the human brain works. That's also exponential. We're doubling the spatial resolution of brain scanning every year. We're doubling the amount of brain data we're gathering every year. We're showing we can actually understand how the brain works. We, we, we already have simulations of two dozen regions, regions of the auditory cortex, visual cortex, cerebellum, where we do our skill formation, like catching a fly ball. We understand how a 10-year-old can do that now. We didn't actually understand that a few years ago. Uh, IBM has a project to simulate the, the cerebral cortex, or at least a significant slice of it. This is all scaling up exponentially. And I make the case in, in my books and, and talks that Within 25 years, we will have models and simulations of all several hundred regions of the human brain. So we'll have a model of, of how human intelligence works. We'll understand the basic principles of operation. We actually already know a lot more than we did just a few years ago from, from these kinds of efforts. Computers, for $1,000, you'll be able to have enough computation to simulate the entire human brain based on the most conservative estimates of how much computation is required. That'll cost a dollar in 2030. It'll cost a penny in 2037. Go out to 2045, that's a date I've designated as a singularity. We're simply referring to a very profound, disruptive change in the nature of intelligence. The non-biological intelligence that, that our civilization creates will be a billion times more capable than all of the biological intelligence. Mm -hmm. the, the biological intelligence, I've estimated at 10 to the 26th power of calculations per second with a lot of software. That's basically the six, seven billion human brains we have. Well, the non-biological intelligence, the computers we have, which will also be imbued with the same capabilities and the same knowledge, will be a billion times greater than that by 2045. You've got another 50 years, and it'll be trillions of trillions of times more powerful. So that's a really fantastic transformation. So if we look at it from the time of the, say, the beginning of the 19th century to the end of the 21st century, you know, a couple, 300 years, 250 years, we've gone from virtually no technology or, you know, horse and, horse and buggy to this incredible, but what does that mean right. for the a far future? 1850, the best way to send a message was with the Pony Express. <laughs> and a few centuries later, 
we will have very sublime forms of non-biological intelligence, which will greatly outstrip you know, all of human intelligence today. So that's the nature of exponential growth. And really, most observers think linearly. They think the current pace of change will continue. And, and, they, and of course, it's a big difference. You count from 1 to 10 linearly, you get to 1,000 <laughs> exponentially. You count 1 to 30 linearly, you get to a billion exponentially. And it keeps growing in fantastic, uh, in fantastic ways. Uh, this will be very transformative. That's why it's referred to as a singularity, just because it's so hard to see beyond that event horizon. It's really borrowing this metaphor from physics. So that's why it's hard to say, well, think ahead a million years. I mean, it's hard to think ahead a hundred years <laughs> if we're going to multiply the intelligence of our civilization, you know, trillions or even trillions of trillions fold within a century or so. Uh, now, we will, now people say, well, you know, Kurzweil just thinks exponentially, and, these, and we all know that exponentials don't go on forever. Rabbits multiply exponentially, <laughs> and you could say, well, there must be a trillion rabbits within short order, but that doesn't happen because the exponential growth stops. They eat up all the foliage, and that's the end of the exponential growth. And yes, we do see limits to the exponential growth of any particular paradigm to information technology. For example, there were shrinking vacuum tubes in the 1950s, making them smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And so the computation grew exponentially, and, they, and that hit a wall. They couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes and keep the vacuum, and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was <laughs> not the end of the exponential growth of computing. It went, jumped to another paradigm. So Moore's Law, which people have heard of, which is the shrinking of the size of features on a, on a chip, integrated circuit. Every two years, we can put twice as many, and they run faster. Uh, that was not the first paradigm to bring exponential growth. That is not the sum total. That's just one example of many of this inherently exponential growth. It's the fifth paradigm. That will run out of steam. Actually, the first predictions were 2002. Intel now says 2022. By that time, the key features will be 5 nanometers, which is 20 carbon atoms. We won't be able to shrink them anymore. But we'll go to the sixth paradigm. What is that? That's three-dimensional molecular computing. Chips are already very dense, 65 nanometer features, but they're flat. They're two-dimensional. We live in a three-dimensional world. We might as well use the third dimension. And that, so what happens in information technologies, particular methods for, for advancing these, these technologies exponentially hit a wall. It creates research pressure to create the next method. We've been going with Moore's Law for several decades. That will run out of steam. That will go to the next paradigm of three-dimensional molecular circuits like nanotubes, which are already working in laboratories. One cubic inch of nanotube circuitry at its limits would be 100 million times more powerful than the human brain, one, one cubic inch. Uh, and even that's not the ultimate limits for three-dimensional molecular computing. But if people say, well, there must be some overall limits. Forget the paradigm. Yeah. Just based <laughs> on what we know about physics of computation and communication to the ability to support computation and communication. And yes, there are limits. I talk about those. But they're not very limiting. Uh, ultimately, one kilogram of, of matter could be something like 10 to the 50th uh, calculations per second, which is you know trillions of trillions of times more powerful than the human brain. Uh, that's the ultimate limit. We will get to those limits by, say, on the order of 100 years from now. And we will saturate the matter and energy that we care to devote to computation in our vicinity, say, on this planet, and even, say, some nearby celestial bodies. At that point, that really is a limit. And the only way to, to really expand is to expand out into the rest of the universe. Now, we, we know there are fantastic distances. I mean, the very f nearest star it takes four years to get to. For right? light. If you travel right. at the speed of light, which is supposed to be a limit. And this various suggestions that you can go faster than light, but they turn out to be tantalizing but not realizable. For example, stars could be traveling faster than the speed of light away from each other if they are more than a certain distance apart based on the expansion of the universe. Because the space is expanding. But Because the space is expanding. That doesn't let you send messages yeah. faster than the speed yeah. of light. And uh, quantum disentanglement has been measured at far faster than the speed of light, but you can't really send information. Right. You can only share yeah. sort of random events so that you can encrypt files that way, but you can't really send information files. You've talked about the possibility that the speed of light may be changing over very long periods of time. And if that's true, you said, 
It's fascinating that engineering has always found a way to manipulate very subtle changes with the kind of computing power you're talking right. about. Right. I mean, that's the, that's the essence of technology, to take a subtle scientific observation and focus it like the, like the rays of the sun to a, to a point where it can be very effective. There's a subtle observation that it's slightly less air pressure over a curved wing if it's moving <laughs> than under a wing. Well, out of that little subtle scientific observation, with suitable engineering, we created the whole world of aviation. So if, in fact, there's been changes in the speed of light, and, there's, and this is controversial. Some right. people have made observations where they think there's been a small change, but other people disagree. If there have been changes, it presumably it's not because time has passed, it's because conditions are different. And that, you know, perhaps is a subtle scientific observation that can then be manipulated through engineering to actually change the speed of light. Uh, another intriguing suggestion, which appears to be consistent with some interpretations of, of general relativity, is there could be wormholes, or we may even be able to engineer them, or there may be a whole network of wormholes mm -hmm. left over from the early development of the universe, uh, which are not, so this would not involve actually superseding the speed of light, but basically finding shortcuts because space is not the three-dimensional construct that our intuition tells us. That we know there are other dimensions, or at least some of the theories, I mean some theories of string theory have uh, 10 or 12 dimensions. There may be shortcuts through other dimensions that would get us to other places that are apparently far away uh, you know, more quickly. And with the kind of computing power that we'll have available, that we'd be able to exploit those kinds of, of subtle features of, of space-time. It's not just computation, but intelligence. I mean, it, we can consider intelligence to be the most powerful phenomena in the world. Look how we've transformed our world. Ultimately, intelligence can trump natural phenomena. Uh, you know, the dinosaurs disappeared be some tens of millions of years ago. Uh, leading theory is because of an asteroid or meteor. Uh, the next one that hits it, we're likely to, in fact, trump with our intelligence. We'll, we'll see it coming. We'll send some mission, and we'll uh, divert it or blow it up. Uh, ultimately, engineering can overcome natural phenomena. And it, and ultimately, our intelligence will spread out through the rest of the universe. And a real key issue, which we don't worry much about now, but in fact, I think will be a preoccupation of human civilization a century or so from now, is, is there some way of superseding the speed of light, either finding shortcuts or wormholes or engineering changes? Because if we can't, and if we're really stuck with it taking four years to get to the nearest star and billions of years to get to other galaxies, and it's going to take a long time to spread out to the rest of the universe. And, we'll, we'll, and that'll be a fairly slow process. And that will slow down this exponential expansion. Of course, it will reach fantastic levels just with the resources we have here on Earth. But then it would take a long time. Or if we can supersede it, we will. And if there's any subtle way of doing it, our intelligence will be so vast by that point, we'll be able to find and develop and magnify uh, and leverage those opportunities.